Ladies and gentlemen, boys, girls, and our non-binary friends, welcome. I am Anna the Good Fairy, and I'm here to tell you about the great British theatrical tradition that is pantomime, or panto for short. Panto. Panto. British panto. What? Panto is a uniquely British holiday tradition. Pantalones? Because that, that's Spanish for pants. Johnny Depp is my dearest friend, and he's doing a movie right now as Panto. Really? It's like a gyro type thing? No, 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 we're talking Tonto. Tonto. Like a Greek sandwich? Panto has been a staple of Christmas theatre all over Britain for over 150 years, but its origins extend back much further. Panto in its current form started as the Harlequinade, an anglicised version of Commedia dell'arte. Commedia dell'arte features stock characters, hijinks and a love plot that saves the day. The Harlequinade borrowed this art form, threw in a lot of stapstick and bad jokes, and the pantomime was born. Now there are several key elements that go into a pantomime, the first being the story. Most pantomimes are based on fairy tales or classic stories. Popular adaptations include Aladdin, Dick Whittington, Mother Goose, Peter Pan, Robin Hood and Jack and the Beanstalk. While using well-known stories, most theatre companies create their own version of the story, with elements we shall explore now. So the next element, the characters. As we've said before, there are several stock characters in every panto. The first we are introduced to are the agents of good and evil. The play and the inciting action are usually introduced by two characters, one representing good, such as a good fairy, genie, spirit, and one representing evil, such as a devil, witch, sorcerer. The convention of having these characters goes back to medieval morality plays, remember sodomy, even retaining the convention that the good fairy always appear on the audience right, representing heaven, and the evil demon on the audience left, representing hell. These characters are locked in a battle, rooting for the hero to succeed or fail, depending on their affiliation. At some point in the play, one or other of them will interfere with the plot. Even stories which do not have other fantastical elements in them will have these supernatural characters commenting on the progress of our hero and helping him or hindering him in his quest. To emphasise their otherworldly status, they often speak in rhyme. Which brings us on to our hero or principal boy, who is played by a girl. Yes, the principal boy is a breeches role usually out to seek his fortune and win the hand of a fair maiden, who is also played by a girl. These days, more often than not, the principal boy is played by an actual boy, but some pr productions still maintain the tradition of putting a girl in the tights, boots and big hat. Another thing you can't do without is some kind of animal sidekick. Usually a horse, cow, camel or other four-legged creature is played by two people in a suit and will get up to mischief, dance and generally be disobedient. There's a baddie, whose job is to prevent our hero from attaining his dream, making his fortune winning the hand of the fair maiden. There are various other ancillary characters, hapless henchmen of the baddie, witless sidekick or brother of the principal boy, a chorus who do duty as villagers, ghosts, fairies or animals are as the story commands. But no panto would be complete without a dame. The mainstay of any panto, the dame is the matriarch of the performance, the queen of misrule. The archetype of the Panto Dame can be seen in Shakespeare. Think the nurse in Romeo and Juliet. It's often the principal boy's mother, usually middle-aged and working class. In Aladdin, she runs a laundry. In Dick Whittington, she's a cook. In Babes in the Wood, she's a nurse. But don't let her lowly origins fool you. Just because she's from humble beginnings doesn't mean she isn't fabulous. The Dame will appear in several huge and highly decorated costumes with heavy drag makeup on. Glamazon she's not, but a high camp, high energy, innuendo force to be reckoned with. Some of Britain's most famous drag queens have taken up the mantle, including Danny LaRue, Paul O'Grady, even though his alter ego Lily Savage retired many years ago, and Dame Edna Everidge. Okay, she's Australian, but we claim her as one of our own, part of the Commonwealth and all that. The Dame will be involved in misunderstandings, slapstick, pratfalls, and most importantly, innuendo, which brings us to our last element theatrical conventions. Innuendo is a must. Just because Panto is a family show doesn't mean it has to be boring for the adults. So heavily sprinkled in amongst the conversations will be slightly risque humour. Let's talk about the fourth wall. There is no fourth wall. 
Panto is an art form completely dependent on art audience participation. In actual fact, this used to be the norm in theatres. Sitting quietly in the dark while actors emote at you was invented only during modernism from the likes of Stanislavski, Chekhov and Ibsen. There are two main types of audience participation, the type you're expected to already know and the type the cast invite you to. Traditional participation includes booing the demon and the baddie, cheering the good fairy and the hero and arguing with people on stage, mainly the dame. For example, someone will point out that they believe something they believe to be a fact and someone would dispute this by saying, oh no it isn't, to which the reply would be, oh yes it is. Each character will then attempt to enlist part of the audience on their side, calling, oh no it isn't, oh yes it is, back and forth for a minute or so. Another instance where audience response is elicited is when a character is on the hunt for something. The traditional response is, it's behind you, followed by calls and points to see where the thing is, as the character persists in looking in every corner of the stage, but where the audience is pointing, until they get the idea and find the thing. It's also used when a character is being sneaked up on, feigning ignorance until it is too late. Another significant part of pantomime, whether you write your own script or not, is to make it relevant to the community watching it. Most pantos go on at community theatres, so tailoring jokes for the community is an important way of engaging your audience. Singing and dancing are also important parts of panto, with popular songs being used, possibly with new lyrics being added. Often, the dame will invite children on stage to sing along with her, handing out candy at the end and throughout. Lots of candy being thrown into the audience just to get the kids nice and hyper. These days, Panto is big business. In 2016, it came back to the London Palladium after a 30-year hiatus. And up and down the country, TV and film stars don tights and wigs and strut their comfy stuff all over the Christmas holidays. Of course, we now have many examples of queering fairy tales, from cartoons such as Red Hot Riding Hood to the TV show Once Upon a Time, the Shrek series of films and the musical Wicked. It is because of the ubiquity of these stories that we are able to riff on the themes and turn them into something that is both pro easily processed by children but still amusing for adults. It completely owes this aesthetic to Panto. Now we've, I've whetted your appetite, how about reading a couple? I can't hear you. I said, shall we read some Pantos? Oh wait, I can't hear you. You're all safe at home, safe and sheltering in place. Well, attached below are a couple of scripts written by my friend Barry. Here's Barry, mild-mannered, store manager by day, panto dame extraordinaire by night. He's written a dozen pantos, many of which have won awards and are regularly staged in the Greater Manchester area. I've included a link below to his website. So I hope that's been fun and informative and here's wishing you good health and good cheer. Goodbye.